I'm Bernadette Peters. Do you know who you are? In preparation for this episode, I asked my subscribers where they first became aware of Bernadette Peters. For millennials like me, it might have been in the Disney TV adaptation of Cinderella, or maybe your VHS copy of Annie. Maybe without really knowing it, it might have been in animated projects like Anastasia or Rita on Animaniacs. Humans ain't what they seem to be. If you grew up in the 1970s, you probably saw at least one of her many appearances on television, guest starring on everything from The Carol Burnett Show to The Muppets. Maybe you saw her on screen with Steve Martin in movies like The Jerk or Pennies from Heaven. Regardless of where you first learned about her, Bernadette Peters is probably best known as one of the great leading ladies of the musical theater, and her close association with composer-lyricist Stephen Sondheim has distinguished her as one of the most beloved and well-respected performers in the Broadway theater. With her prolific concert work, her still frequent appearances on television, and her celebrated returns to the Broadway stage, it's clear that people still love Bernadette Peters. This is impressive, of course, but the road to such notoriety is complicated, and honestly, not one that I was wholly aware of before. It's a series of evolving images, perceptions by the media, and a woman finally coming into her own as an indomitable force in the Broadway theater. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about Bernadette Peters and her incredible career. Before we get started, make sure to like this video, hit that subscribe button, so you can see more of this content. Here is Jack Barry and his juvenile jury. That, that, mother wants to ride on buses and I don't want it. Your mother wants to ride on buses and you don't want to? What do you want to ride in? Taxi kit. This is Bernadette Lazada's first appearance on television, at three and a half years old, as a contestant on the NBC Children's Game Show, Juvenile Jury. Joe? How much money do you think your mommy and daddy has? A hundred dollars? I think what Joe is trying to bring out is that it's... They spend it. What'd you say, Bernadette? They spend it on candy. This appearance, along with appearing on the game show Name That Tune at five and a half years old, were all initiated by Bernadette's mother, Marguerite Lazada, a housewife from Ozone Park, Queens. And Bernadette's early impressions of show business were ambivalent, to say the least. It was a hobby for me. And I didn't understand kids in show business. I didn't care for them too much because they weren't very real. They say they'd stand on the line and just kind of like smile for no reason at, at, at the yeah. producers and stuff. I never was hired because I was like a, you know, a sour puss little girl because I'd look at them and thinking, what are they doing? What are they smiling about? Upon earning her equity card at just nine years old, Marguerite was advised to change her daughter's surname from Lazada to Peters after her father's namesake. While she explained the name would fit better on a marquee, it was closer to the truth that she wanted her daughter to be thought of as all-American, rather than pigeonholed as an Italian or ethnic actress. The whitewashing or erasure of a performer's ethnicity is a dark and very real fact in the history of entertainment. Take for instance Rita Consino, who went through an exhaustive makeover at Columbia Pictures to become Rita Hayworth. This is not to conflate Hispanics with Italians, but this kind of degrading assimilation reached many ethnic groups. In an essay by Emily Furlick, she says that while Italians have since assimilated into an umbrella of whiteness in the United States, there was still prejudice against Italian Americans. Peter's pale complexion likely also saved her from the colorism an Italian American woman with darker skin might have dealt with, and of course, she experienced none of the systemic racism that women of color in the entertainment industry faced. Marguerite would go even further, with Bernadette remembering, she would tint my hair. I would say, what are you doing? And she'd say, oh, I'm just putting a little conditioner on it. But slowly, my hair got blonder and blonder. It's probably not hard to understand why Bernadette felt so ambivalent about show business at such a young age. Despite this, Bernadette is rather empathetic about her mother, saying that she wasn't a typical stage mother. An arrangement had been made that Bernadette could stop any time she wanted to, and other than the odd out-of-town engagement, she generally stuck close to home and was able to live a relatively normal childhood. As a teenager, she studied acting under David LeGrant, having studied himself at the actor's studio under Lee Strasberg. LeGrant encouraged his students to personalize their work, letting themselves come through in the roles that they played, not to emulate or imitate. 
She would always cite him as a major influence as a performer, recalling he would say, There's only one of you in the world, and never try to be like anyone else. If appearing on the Broadway stage were a paradigm for success, Bernadette had found it rather quickly. While she had appeared as a child in City Center's limited revival of The Most Happy Fella, as an adult, Bernadette was cast in two Broadway shows in 1967. But unfortunately, both these shows were short-lived flops. Then in 1968, Bernadette was cast in the musical George M, playing Josie Cohen and starring alongside Joel Grey. In his memoir, he writes, It was startling when this young, adorably young girl sang. No one had ever heard a sound like that. We all fell in love with her immediately. Where there were five or six actors being considered for every part, no one could compete with Bernadette. She was Josie. She and I got along immediately, and I quickly became a safe retreat when her mother was driving her crazy, which was often. In spite of the show's early buzz, reception for George M. was mixed, with many dismissing the show as naively patriotic and at odds with the anti-war sentiments of the time. Bernadette's notices were often perfunctory at best, and most of the attention, whether good or bad, went to Joel Grey. Later in 1968, Bernadette appeared in an off-Broadway musical called Dames at Sea. She had actually performed in an earlier version of the show back in 1966, then performed in the back room of a coffee house in Greenwich Village. It was a scrappy, loving send-up of Busby Berkeley movies from the 1930s. Having grown up watching these films on television and idolizing performers like Ginger Rogers and Ruby Keeler, Bernadette knew how to pull the style off. Dames at Sea was a huge hit off-Broadway, and Bernadette's performance was regularly singled out by the critics. Sometime after the show opened, Carol Burnett attended a performance, and so taken by her, went backstage to invite Bernadette to appear as a guest on her new variety television program, The Carol Burnett Show. This appearance would ultimately air on September 23, 1969, where Bernadette performed a sketch and number that once again parodied Busby Berkeley movies like 42nd Street and Gold Diggers of 1933. You can replace her! No, I can't! I can't sing! I can't dance! I've, I don't know the number! I've never been on a stage before in my entire life! Oh, come on! Be a good sport! <laughs> okay. <laughs> While we don't have readily available footage of Bernadette in Dames at Sea, this performance gives us a pretty good idea of what audiences might have experienced off-Broadway. She's charming, deft on her feet, and while the style reads inherently campy to a contemporary audience, she never gives in to cynicism or making a comment on the performance. She's in on the joke, rather than the joke being on her. Bernadette's next stage musical, La Strada, would mark her first lead in a Broadway show. But rehearsals were plagued with creative issues, and after dismal reviews, the show's opening night also became its closing night. In his New York Times review, Clive Barnes wrote, In another show, Bernadette Peters would have become a star overnight. Going into the 1970s, Bernadette would begin a very busy decade on television. At least at first, her appearances always were rooted in the theater. Take for example her reprisal performance as Josie in the TV version of George M, playing Libby in Clifford Odette's Paradise Lost, and Lady Larkin in the 1972 TV version of Once Upon a Mattress. She'd still make appearances on the Broadway stage, not to mention other regional and off-Broadway shows, but she was gaining far more recognition, and frankly money, with her appearances on television. I think it's important to note that she was being well-received for her theater work. While her performance in the 1971 revival of On the Town gained her glowing notices as well as a Tony nomination, the show only ran about two months. Meanwhile, she was able to book roles on TV shows like Love, American Style, as well as appearances on Ed Sullivan and The David Steinberg Show. Her next show on Broadway was in the Jerry Herman musical Mac and Mabel, a fabled telling of the doomed romance between film director Mac Sennett and silent film actress Mabel Normand. While its cast and score were generally applauded, critics took issue with the show's gloomy book. Personally, I like a lot of Mac and Mabel's score, but it's one of those shows that has never really worked, in spite of many revised versions over the years. Mac and Mabel would close after only 65 performances. Bernadette would receive a Tony nomination for Best Leading Actress in a Musical, ultimately losing to Angela Lansbury. By then, Bernadette had basically settled on the West Coast and had unofficially put theater on the back burner. 
It wasn't like Mac and Mabel was the nail in the coffin. She'd been eyeing a change for some time, starting to grow tired of her offers in the Broadway theater, usually some vampy subrette in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. It would be 10 years before Bernadette would set foot on a Broadway stage again, and only then would audiences start to see her in a new light. Through the 1970s, Bernadette kept very busy working in television. Her appearances may have been brief, but they were often memorable and kept her in the public eye. And honestly, her output during this decade is kind of insane. Having watched many of these appearances, it's easy to see why she fared so well during this time. Her versatility speaks for itself, of course, vacillating between the CBS situation comedy, All's Fair, which earned her a Golden Globe nomination, and being a frequent guest on programs like The Carol Burnett Show, where she would appear a total of 11 times. But there were also appearances with the likes of Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Donnie and Marie, Sonny and Cher, The Muppets, which is just kind of amazing. There's also something to be said about her presence on camera, her confidence and simplicity, and being still, an underestimated skill that has made it difficult for other stage performers to transition to the screen. And obviously, she is just radiant on camera. In 1979, Bernadette appeared on screen in the movie The Jerk, alongside then-boyfriend Steve Martin. <laughs> I don't really love talking about these kinds of things on my channel, but it's near impossible to talk about this period without acknowledging their relationship. They had met in 1977, just as he was making a name for himself as a stand-up comedian, and their relationship, along with her appearance in The Jerk, no doubt elevated her own profile. The Jerk became a commercial and critical success. Janet Maslin of the New York Times wrote, even when it's crude, which is a lot of the time, it's not mean-spirited. In comedy this broad, that's half the battle. Mr. Martin and his co-star, Bernadette Peters, work very sweetly together, even when they sing a duet of Tonight You Belong To Me, carrying sweetness to what could easily have become an intolerable extreme. Their next movie together in 1981 would be the movie musical Pennies From Heaven, I have to admit not initially getting this movie when I first watched it, and I think my experience was not dissimilar to what audiences in 1981 experienced. Rather than a glitzy homage to Busby Berkeley movies of the 1930s, as seemingly advertised, audiences were perplexed to find a dark, neo-Brechtian piss take on the genre. While the film was not without its fans, it was considered a box office bomb. It's certainly not a movie for everyone, but there is a lot to admire. On a personal note, having come to this movie rather late, I was struck by how many moments of this movie have come to be referenced or, at the very least, the source of inspiration in recent film and TV projects, which more than anything is a testament to the ambitiousness of this movie. The disappointing reception of the film was soon followed by an even bigger box office bomb, literally released the week after Pennies from Heaven, in the movie Heartbeeps, where Bernadette played the role of Aquacom 89045 and I just, I just don't know what there is to say here. She fared far better in her next film. While the movie itself wasn't exactly loved by the critics, her appearance as Lily St. Regis in the film adaptation of Annie, albeit short, was well received, working alongside Tim Curry and her old friend, Carol Burnett. I betcha Miss Sticky Fingers here can loan you a lousy five bucks. I beg your pardon, I'm sure. But... I don't stoop to what you're incinerating. But as iconic as this performance is, under the cold light of day, it seems along the lines of the roles that Bernadette had once been frustrated with. I would definitely put Pennies from Heaven in this category as well, though I'd also argue that her role there allowed her to show off more range and versatility. While she continued to keep busy in the early 1980s, I think the industry still might have been struggling with what to do with her. She entered the decade with two back-to-back -back albums, the first of which had a single that placed high on the Billboard charts. But the recording industry never took her seriously. Instead, they held the old guard and pegged her as a Broadway singer, in spite of the fact that she hadn't appeared on a Broadway stage in nearly a decade. In spite of being a constant presence in the entertainment world, she was never considered an A-list star, and therefore may not have been afforded the opportunities for more varied work, which is a shame, really. 
Earlier in her career, there were little glimpses of her unexplored range. For instance, I think her work in Paradise Lost demonstrates her knack for a darker and serious drama. And while she would eventually work with Sondheim in the very near future, I sometimes wonder how thrilling she would have been playing Marta and Company, or even April, which she did play, kind of and very briefly, on a television special in 1979. Is because I just can't get interested in myself. I'm just so boring. Well, I find you very interesting. Well, I'm just not. <laughs> I used to think I was so odd, but my roommate is the same way. He's also very dumb. Well, you never told me about him. Uh, are you two lovers? Oh, no, we just share this great big apartment up on West End Avenue. We have our own rooms and everything. I'd show it to you, but we've never had company. He's the sweetest thing, actually. I think he likes the arrangement. I don't know, though. We never discuss it. He was born in New York, so nothing really interests him. <laughs> But, as has come up multiple times on this channel, the industry isn't particularly invested in letting performers grow into new roles, preferring to cast them as specific types, and critics can be especially susceptible to this. Early in her career, Bernadette's tiny frame and vulnerable performances had her constantly labeled as waif-like and doll-like. Her big eyes and infamous pout made critics liken her to a Cupid doll. This is a Cupid doll. Any changes to this perception were usually initiated on her end. After a suggestion by hairstylist Maury Hobson, Bernadette stopped straightening her hair in the 1970s. She gradually stopped tinting it blonde, giving way to her iconic plume of dark copper. She began appearing in sexier photo shoots, showing off her curves, posing for people like Alberto Vargas, and even posing for an issue of Playboy in 1981, though not in the nude. While broadening her appeal, she still maintains agency and control over her image, and some of the most frustrating moments in researching for this video has been watching her sit through interviews where men confuse her confidence as permission to objectify her. Did I read that you're doing a spread for Playboy? Is this our Bernadette? <coughs> Doing something for Playboy. Is that true? I did, yes. Really? Mm -hmm. Christmas, we'll be sure. Christmas, you got that, Doc? I've got it marked down. <laughs> you did. Yeah. She's rather classy and demure in how she deflects these detentions away, but her discomfort is clearly palpable. A tiny glimpse into what women like Bernadette Peters have had to put up with in show business. In 1983, Bernadette received a phone call from James Lapine. He had seen her performance at the Academy Awards on television that year and immediately saw her for a part he was writing about pointillist artist George Seurat and the creation of his painting, A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grand Jatte. After reading a two-page outline, Bernadette was compelled and quickly said yes to the project, which would be workshopped in New York later that summer. Sunday in the Park with George marked Bernadette's long-anticipated return to the New York stage, although that actually wasn't true. She'd appeared off-Broadway in 1982 in the play Sally and Masha, starring alongside Christine Baranski. Though even that, along with Sunday, showed Bernadette's desire to switch things up in her career, even if it meant appearing in smaller projects and receiving a sizable pay cut. But she was clearly excited about the project, as well as the prospect of working with composer-lyricist Stephen Sondheim. With Sunday, Sondheim found himself at a peculiar professional crossroads. After a decade of innovative shows that helped change the landscape of the musical theater on Broadway, 1981's Merrily We Roll Along was a critical and commercial failure that effectively ended his long creative partnership with director Hal Prince. Not long after this, Sondheim met James Lapine, and regardless of him being virtually inexperienced as a theater director, they agreed to collaborate on a show together. This time, the show would be developed off-Broadway at Playwrights Horizon. In Sunday in the Park with George, Bernadette plays Dot, George's mistress who also acts as his muse. Their relationship is fractious, with Dot constantly at odds with George's obsession with his art. 
Their affair is doomed, though he does make a point to immortalize her in his painting. As explored in James Lapine's book, Putting It Together, the workshop process for Sunday in the Park with George was an intense and unusual ordeal for the time. Workshops of new shows weren't that common yet, with most producers using their out-of-town engagements as a way to try out new material. In the case of Sunday, musical numbers were still being added during performances of the show at Playwrights Horizon. While still very much a work in progress, the Schuberts, along with producer Emanuel Eisenberg, signed on to bring the show to Broadway in the spring of 1984. Bernadette was slow to sign on for the Broadway run, but only because she felt the character of Dot disappeared into the background after the initial studio scene in Act 1, and that she needed a musical moment to truly express her frustration with George. Sondheim and Lapine came to understand her concern to be intuitive to the success of the show, rather than her simply seeking a bigger part. The show's initial performances on Broadway were fraught, with massive walkouts and even the heckling of actors from audience members. But as the final musical numbers were added right before opening, the piece itself came together, very much like George Seurat's painting in the show. Critics and audiences were divided on Sunday in the Park with George, a show that inherently challenges what commercial audiences expect from an art form like the musical theater. Bernadette Peters, along with her co-star Mandy Patinkin, would both receive Tony nominations, and later in the run, Sunday would win the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. After leaving the show, Bernadette would return to Broadway in 1985's Song and Dance, with a score by Andrew Lloyd Webber, Bernadette played the role of Emma, an English hat maker who settles in New York in search of love. The first act was a virtuosic feat, with Bernadette carrying the entire hour by herself on stage, while the second act played out as a kind of choreographed encapsulation of the first, featuring an ensemble of dancers. While the show had fared well in its original London production, critics were rather prickly with the Broadway premiere, with Frank Rich calling the material empty and the character of Emma a completely synthetic, not to mention insulting creation whom no performer could redeem. But in the same article, he trumpeted Bernadette, saying that as an actress, singer, and comedian, and all-around warming presence, she has no peer in the musical theater right now. In reviewing the Broadway cast album, Stephen Holden summarized how Bernadette's persona had not only saved the show, but finally hit with audiences. Miss Peters has always oozed a cuddlesome Shirley Temple-like sweetness and vulnerability. This quality, which used to seem more like an adorable childlike star affectation than a deep-seated trait, has proved to be an essential ingredient of Miss Peters' personality. A delivery that once seemed coy and cutesy has deepened and ripened into an honesty and compassion that pour out in singing that is childlike, but also resilient. For this performance, Bernadette Peters finally won the Tony Award for Best Leading Actress in a Musical. She would stay with the show for a year, briefly taking a leave from the production to film the TV version of Sunday in the Park with George for Showtime, literally down the street from where she was performing in Song and Dance. Then in the fall of 1987, she returned to the Broadway stage in yet another Sondheim Lapine musical, Into the Woods, which reimagined and re-explored the beloved Grimm fairy tales. Bernadette actually joined as a replacement for Ellen Folly, who had appeared in the San Diego tryout of the show earlier that year. It took negotiations to make it all work. Bernadette was scheduled to film the movie Slaves of New York later that spring, making her run with the show a limited one. But after her experience with Sunday in the Park with George, she was eager for the opportunity to work with James Lapine and Stephen Sondheim again. In Into the Woods, Bernadette played the role of the witch. Cursed by her mother and ostracized by society, she becomes the show's surprising voice of reason and its moral center. Some may think she was robbed of a Tony nomination that year. The reasons why vary depending entirely on who you ask, though she was gracious enough to present the Best Actress Award to her co-star, Joanna Gleason. In spite of this, I think her performance in Into the Woods did cement her as an esteemed interpreter of Stephen Sondheim. But the trifecta of Sunday in the Park with George, Song and Dance, and Into the Woods solidified her position as a major player in the musical theater. While Sunday might not be as accessible as her other work, it showed her willingness to take on more challenging and daring material. 
Song and Dance demonstrated her virtuosity and the ability to breathe life into a character that might have been otherwise disliked by the audience. With Into the Woods, she got to have fun with a very different kind of character part for her. But I also think the show allowed her to demonstrate her refined strengths as a performer, her technical skill, her specificity, and a kind of depth that had always probably been there but never seriously contended with. If her image had been shaped by years of evoking a nostalgic form of entertainment, this period of work allowed her to reinvent herself and shape her persona on her own terms. This is an opportunity that is not afforded to all, but speaks of her drive to take ownership of her career and its trajectory. So, Obviously, Bernadette Peters' career is extensive, and I couldn't possibly cover everything she's done, or we'd be here all day. What I do want to look at, though, is what this varied career represents and what we can learn from it. Watching her through the decades, it's fascinating to follow the evolution of her image and how she adapts herself to that particular moment. And she's been doing that since she was a child, if only then at second hand. This modification of her image does start from a very complicated place. The implications of the whitewashing of her Italian background as a child does get a bit murky. Bernadette's frankness in talking about it shows that she herself has had to confront these decisions, as well as perhaps understanding where her mother was coming from. She wanted me to have more options in my career than an Italian girl, I think, so playing Italian roles. I think if my name was Bernadette Lazara, I would have had a whole different, like on the Magnani career, you know? I would have been a serious actress? Italian actress. Okay. When I, did you I, change I, it? I think. This leans into an interesting aspect of Bernadette's persona. While she can be open about talking about past projects or her annual charity, Broadway Barks, she keeps the public and media at arm's length to the more intimate aspects of her personal life, where some personalities willingly take the bait on divulging their controversial opinions to the media. Bernadette is rather calculated in what she shares of herself, and this has been the case going back years. In a 1982 Esquire magazine profile, Bernadette was asked what she was like growing up, to which she quipped back, why should I answer that? It's going to be in an article. In her Playboy interview, she says that, I'm not real comfortable talking about my private life. I'm such a public person that I need something left to myself. It's only fair. To a certain extent, I think her remoteness as a public figure gives her perception a blank slate, which allows her appeal to extend beyond a singular scope. When talking about the roles she plays, she says, In a way, I feel my privacy actually serves the public better. If I give away too much, there won't be a whole person for them to see. I can definitely agree to this to a certain point, but if you've reached the level of stardom that Bernadette Peters has, your audience is probably hyper-aware of the person they are watching, no matter what role they play. There are some positives to this, though. For instance, I find it interesting that the two Tonys she's received for performances were both for shows where she received praise, but the productions themselves were received rather negatively. Star power like Bernadette's can be the saving grace for a production, but in some cases can also cause complication. Many found her shrewish or, quote, crotchety performance as Paula in 1993's The Goodbye Girl seemingly at odds with the warm and bubbly image that audiences had grown used to. Years later, many were initially skeptical of her playing the dowdy and gloomy Sally in the 2011 revival of the musical Follies. But never was she more at odds with public perception than when she was cast as Mama Rose in the 2003 Broadway revival of Gypsy. Bernadette's history with the show dated back to performing in the show's second national company as a teenager. As an adult, the undertaking in playing this revered and mammoth role stood as an incredible professional feat. She also acknowledged the chance to inhabit a role that would bring her closer to her loving but ambitious stage mother, Marguerite. News of Bernadette's casting immediately launched debates about whether she could pull off the role, which has become entwined with the memory of the woman who first played it, Ethel Merman. Her brassy, bulldozer stamp on the role had more or less been emulated by subsequent actresses up to that point. The soft-voiced Bernadette Peters, along with her small and girlish figure, would present the potential for a whole new take on the part. Director Sam Mendes reveled in getting to reinvent the role and potentially the show itself. Remember that he had recently found acclaim in his dark reimagining of the musical Cabaret starring Alan Cumming. 
In an interview, he would say, One of the main reasons I wanted to do the piece was to cast someone as Rose that was closer to Rose as she really existed. She was a tiny woman, and she was a charmer, and so was Bernadette. I think the tradition of battle axes in that role has been explored. Theater insiders remained skeptical, and nobody was as loud about their doubts, real or otherwise, as Michael Riedel of the New York Post, who acted as the production's unofficial troll. He once said, I like being able to go after someone's show. I like the battle, a little swordplay. When Bernadette began missing shows due to illness, he dedicated several columns about disappointed audiences at Gypsy, lineups for refunds, saying her frail voice couldn't hold up to the demands of the role. In spite of this, critics generally took her side when reviewing the show, the fault being found instead with Sam Mendes and his interpretation of the material. She was nominated for a Tony again that year, and while she didn't win, her performance of Rose's turn at that year's ceremony was a highlight of the telecast, and remains one of my all-time favorite Tony performances. The Michael Riedel Gypsy Affair does probably remind us to take the media's perceptions with a grain of salt. And yes, I'm aware of the irony of my saying that when I've referenced how many articles and profiles of Bernadette throughout this video. But I think there's a difference between how we equate reporters who measure and critique a situation as it is, and those who are simply there to provoke and insert themselves into the conversation. As the years have gone on, the public have generally been open to Bernadette evolving into different kinds of roles, like Desiree in A Little Night Music, and her more recent Broadway appearance in the revival of Hello, Dolly. And of course, she has continued to book roles on TV shows like Mozart in the Jungle, The Good Fight, and Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, though I'm apparently not alone in wondering why she's not part of the army of Broadway alumni in HBO's The Gilded Age. Maybe they can, you know, find something in season two? Bernadette's career and foray into television in the 1970s made her a forerunner for what we've come to associate with Broadway stardom. Gone are the days when Broadway performers like Mary Martin and Ethel Merman could sustain renowned careers solely on the stage. Broadway stars as we know them today usually try to keep their name in the public eye by vacillating between film and TV work, which only gives them further clout when returning to the Broadway stage. This, of course, is something Bernadette has earned in spades. I've used hyperbolic words like legend and icon in addressing other figures on this channel, and I would still use those words to describe Bernadette. The sheer breadth of her career is extraordinary, as is the grace that she has carried through the ups and downs in show business. But the older I get and come to terms with my own relationship with show business, I tend to look towards the more human aspects of a performer's career. What strikes me most about Bernadette Peters has been her remarkable evolution to be put in show business with little volition of her own, her image scrutinized and reshaped at such a young age, navigating a volatile business and adapting herself to fit the times, and then the extraordinary fortune of having the times meet up with her, emerging as a fully realized personality and a performer that is, most importantly, shaped on her own terms. She remains a remote enough figure that we shouldn't ever assume her own feelings about the journey she has taken. From the outset, we can only marvel at how she has forged a distinguished place in entertainment that is hers and hers alone. Not bad for a kid from Queens. I have something that's so soft. And this something is so luxuriously thick it's almost sinful. I use it every day and then just throw it away. New Kleenex Classic Tissue. Softer and thicker. Pure luxury. I can just throw away. <laughs>